Io ringrazio molto il professor Dotà per delle suggestioni che richiederebbero ore di riflessione. Eh, cosa? Diamo la parola adesso a Anna Masera che coordinerà il primo panel internazionale e seguirà il panel invece nazionale coordinato da Luca De Biase. Prego Anna. Sì, adesso li cambiamo. Buongiorno a tutti. Eh, questo panel sarà in inglese perché è un panel internazionale e abbiamo deciso di parlare tutti in inglese. Uh, please, you can all join me. So, so, hello, I'm Anna Mazera and I'm a journalist at La Stampa and I uh, follow internet subjects. I've been following internet for a long time and I'm here to actually take uh, what uh, Professor Stefano Rodotà just said as an introduction because I think it's, he introduced wonderfully together with uh, Juan Carlos de Martin the topics of our panel. We only have about, I think, 45 minutes, so we will try to um, make you all join into this conversation. It's, uh, it's about, uh, it's about uh, the international point of view of what the issues, the important issues are that are, that are of our concern and that NEXA, we, we wish that NEXA will follow and uh, uh, study. Uh, since there are two panels, one about the international point of view and the international topics, and one about the most specific Italian problems that we would like NEXA to study, uh, we will concentrate more on the international ones. However, uh, talking to all the panelists before we started, many of the topics, of course, of course overlap. And, uh, and what Stefano Rodotà said definitely doesn't have to do only with Italy, it's, it's a global issue, internet is global, it's impossible to put boundaries to problems, to uh, opportunities and uh, uh, risks that uh, rules that might be applied in the wrong way can bring to uh, all of us internet users and to the society as a whole. Um, We decided not to have uh, speeches, but you can all uh, intervene in the discussion. I would like, however, to start with our um, with uh, Colin McClay, he, because he represents Berkman Center, and Berkman Center uh, for Internet and Society inspired NEXA, and uh, it's, it's a center in, at Harvard University, and. Uh, which has been studying internet for the past 10 years, we went to visit Berkman Center and it was actually very inspirational. And I think uh, it's a good point to start on what is the role of university in, um, in helping define what is needed, I mean, in helping studying the internet, in helping uh, Uh, how, do you, how can I say it in English? Um, in helping uh, bringing up the issues for governments, for policies, for uh, private entities, for, uh, so for both the economics and the social issues. Uh, we need uh, some entity that is neutral and uh, Berkman Center has been doing a great job in this. I would like Colin McRae to tell us what Berkman Center has been doing in the past 10 years. Uh, so, so, good morning. Uh, so with that very modest um, 
uh, introduction and uh, request that I tell you what we've been doing for the last 10 years. Um, I would prefer uh, to refer you to, uh, <laughs> to Professor Rodota's uh, wonderful talk, at least as I understood it, which I think he basically taught my entire semester-long Internet and Society course in the 20 or 25 minutes that he spoke. Um, so I feel like, uh, as happy as I am to be here, that my work is now complete because I see that he's already taken care of raising all of the most important and interesting points that we, as uh, a research center um, who care deeply about these issues, take on. So I'm going home. Um, uh, no. So I, I will just give you uh, the briefest background in the Berkman Center. So we were uh, founded uh, a little now 11 years ago at Harvard Law School, um, and uh, just last year became a university-wide research center. Um, and that I think uh, one of the questions people always ask about the Berkman Center is why were you at the law school? Which I think people ask the same of Nexa. Why are you at the Politecnico? Um, it's a very interesting question, and I think it goes to the core of why these topics that we study are, are um, so important, which is that they are explicitly and inherently interdisciplinary, and they require uh, the focus and the methods from a variety of different disciplines, basically all the disciplines, and they involve all the different sectors. Um, it, you can't do this with just computer science or just law or just any particular field any more than you can involve just government or just business or just academia in taking on uh, the challenges and opportunities of uh, the digital revolution. And this is something that uh, we began with and um, in, in our minds as a research center and have seen uh, borne out over the last decade. Um, so the Berkman Center uh, has taken a very participatory approach to all this, believing that um, only by actively engaging in these issues can we really come to understand them and can we come to intervene in a responsible and appropriate way. And um, what that's meant is building code, participating in policy discussions, doing empirical research, uh, engaging communities that no don't normally engage with each other, bringing business and government and activists together to have the hard conversations that inevitably arise as we experience, understand, um, place our hopes upon and our fears upon something as um, diverse, confusing, emergent, dynamic as the internet. Um, so this is the, the mode that we have operated in is at the crossroads of these sectors and disciplines, bringing in students and entrepreneurs and uh, academics, uh, policymakers and others to have these conversations, to undertake research and to have that research make it into the world. Something that has always been important to us is to do that very rigorous empirical work, but also to ensure that we're informing what happens in, in the world. And as our colleague uh, Larry Lessig has um, long presented, this idea of four forces which affect um, you and which regulate you of uh, um, uh, law, architecture, uh, market and norms, those represent to some extent the sectors and the, and the groups that we need to reach out to in order to uh, affect change within the internet space. Um, so that's sort of the, the approach that we've taken um, and it's been challenging, it's also been very rewarding um, and uh, it's precisely um, because of the reward and the challenge that I'm so enthusiastic about uh, the creation of Nexa. Um, and w one of the reasons I'm so honored to be here um, celebrating this inauguration with you all today, um, because it's so important that university engage in meaningful ways in these issues. There are fundamental issues about civil liberties, about the creation and dissemination of knowledge. What could be more important to a university about what we know, how we know it, who we share it with and how we share it and what we do with that information. Um, so we as a center, we focus on these sorts of things, the creation and dissemination of knowledge as it intersects with technology, uh, civic participation and new technologies. This is about democracy, about how we practice, about how we engage with our communities. Um, and finally, about uh, learning and development and reaching underserved communities, how we teach, how we learn differently uh, because of these new technologies. So these are, these are all fundamental and important questions 
by all means um, important to be answered in a variety of sectors, but especially within university where we care about them so deeply and where we find that there's not always a natural constituency or an open, uh, even impartial uh, constituency without vested interests in, in the rest of the uh, in the rest of society. So we, we we have this unique opportunity as a university to play this mediating role where we can look deeper at the facts, approach them from an impartial perspective, use our disciplinary training, and engage uh, those who know and who have different experiences, who have the knowledge, and who have the capacity to implement whatever it is we collectively can uh, ar arise at. So. Um, when you have NEXA join in this very small club of, of like research centers that are focusing on internet and society issues, it's a massive improvement because it allows us to not just know and understand the world that we operate in now, but to reach out into other communities, to other countries, to other continents. Um, and one thing that's clear, um, I think uh, across topics, but certainly the internet is no exception, is that we have a lot to learn from other experiences. Um, we're not all the same. We have different views perhaps about privacy or creativity or, or democracy or anything. Um, but it's indisputable that we can learn from the experiences of others. It does not need, mean that we need to emulate them precisely, but we can learn from them. And that's something that's incumbent upon us. And as we think about informing policymakers, informing businesses, informing civil society, having the opportunity to compare across societies and compare those experiences in rigorous and meaningful ways rather than anecdotal and uh, in, in intuitive ways uh, becomes ever more important. So as we think about open access policies, as we think about broadband policy, as we think about privacy, as we think about any of these new challenges or opportunities that we're confronted with, um, the, the, the responsibility is ever greater for us to learn from our colleagues. So um, to have uh, NEXA um, bringing uh, this wonderful community uh, in to focus on these issues, to um, learn from our experience and to share um, their experience, your experience, and to chart a, a course forward to the next, um, the next frontiers of what we need to learn and understand in order to uh, make this internet uh, truly um, reach the promise that many of us hope uh, or feel that it holds. Um, this is uh, an inherently collaborative and, uh, oddly enough, peer-produced um, effort. And so. Um, I just want to really, um, I, I know it's going to be a tough road and it's, it's hard to change academia and this is something that, um, that anytime you create an interdisciplinary research center, it challenges some of the, uh, the very foundations of academia and it requires someone as visionary as Juan Carlos uh, and as the rector um, of the University of the Politecnico to get that, that it's going to be difficult but that it's going to be worth uh, the battle. Um, and so I don't know that I answered at all the question, but hopefully I, I raised a few important points. Yes. Yes, thank you very much, Colin. I, you're here not just as a representative of Berkman Center and the, the Harvard Cyber Law School, but I mean you're here also as an American and uh, of course we all saw the inauguration of Barack Obama and uh, the great expectations this new president is bringing uh, with this, his new administration. It seems, as Stefano Rodotà pointed out, I mean, that the internet has given a huge, huge contribution to his election and, um, and that he's willing to listen to what the internet society can, from the internet, what, what is coming from the internet, from that type of society. And uh, I was wondering, how will Berkman Center try to interact with policymakers with this new administration? And uh, do you see, I mean, is there an agenda already for this kind of Funny you should ask. Uh, no, uh, we certainly have had a lot of contact with the Obama campaign, the transition team, uh, others of our colleagues at universities and elsewhere involved uh, very much. We actually, in, just in December, did a conference, our third in a series on the internet and politics, mm -hmm. looking precisely at this election. Um, and it is, as you say, it's hugely interesting. This is the, his campaign was what we have all kind of thought was possible. Um, I think the forces aligned in a unique and terrifically fortunate way uh, for, uh, for the president um, in that uh, things worked out the way that people thought they could have. Um, and we all have great expectations at this point that because of his 
he and his team's, uh, his administration's uh, deep understanding of the Internet, its promise and its peril, I suspect, uh, that they are going to have enlightened policies with respect to um, in, across the board in terms of how they use new technologies and that they're going to invest sufficiently. So I think, you know, things that we expect and we will engage on and hope to see everything from a far improved um, broad, national broadband policy, so not just net, network neutrality, which would be sort of one battle within that, but a much more enlightened um, and pro, proactive broadband policy so that the United States can catch up to the rest of the world in broadband. We're, I think, you know, right down there at the bottom in terms of um, what, what we have right now. Um, uh, likewise, um, I think a greater transparency in government, this is certainly on the agenda, using new technologies to allow um, people to understand what's happening, but also to invite their participation in government. I don't think we'll see, you know, to a, a point where um, everyone is, you know, emailing the president saying, dear Mr. President, I think we should do this, but I do think we're going to see a much greater involvement of uh, the people um, in the governing process and the capacity, not, not again, not direct dem democracy, but something much closer to it than what we've seen before. Um, I think along the, the transparency lines are going to be huge gains. I, those are the easiest and most uh, str uh, straightforward places in some respects and something that he's already signaled. Um, likewise, uh, we're hopeful that um, things like open access and creative commons and some sort of, I don't know if we'll see copyright 2.0, um, but some uh, changes in intellectual property law, um, we're hopeful that uh, they'll, at least this administration will be more receptive to them than in past. And so what we'll try to do is engage in public fronts and in private fronts to share our research, to convene uh, policymakers, um, and to uh, in, ex explore and engage these issues to sort of sh share that perspective and, again, to try to jointly uh, chart a course forward. And so, um, you know, we all have a great deal of optimism. This is probably the, or yesterday, the day before, was probably the most optimistic day that we all have had. And we recognize that there's going to be um, a, a, a cold, hard uh, reality uh, uh, crunch at some point, but we're hoping that it's much later rather than sooner. Okay, thank you. So we heard, we heard from the other side of the ocean, and here we are in Europe. And we have uh, Javier Hernandez Ross, who is uh, head of the unit of Information Society and Media at the European Commission. Um, do you agree that the, these are the topics, and these, this is, should be the agenda? And is it similar to the European agenda? And how does it differ if it differs? Uh, I know you are an expert on uh, you following very closely the uh, all what's, what has to, uh, concerns the public domain of access and uh, the reuse of information and accessibility of cultural and scientific information in the European Union and uh, public sector information. What has been done and uh, what are you working on? So first of all, uh, hello to everybody, good morning, and thank you for the NAXA directors to invite me here today, it's a pleasure. And uh, I think everything, most or many of the things have already seen, been said by Professor Rodota, and I think we have a very clear grasp, and Juan Carlos also, about how, how internet is really is a, part, it's a new world. And we now more and more refer in our papers to the analog world and the and the digital world, and then you see in the digital world so many things that it would be, of course, impossible to, to, to say what, what are all the, the, the priorities. What I would like to tell you, of course, is that Internet means disruptive technology. We all know that. It's changing the way we live, the way we work. And that means that when you change things, you have challenges and you have opportunities. And when you have opportunities, someone wins, someone loses. And for changing things, um, of course, you've got opposition forces, and we are seeing that every single day today. Things go so quickly that I'm a civil engineer, and when 20 years ago, when I was doing design, we still were working with paper maps, and today you are working with Google Earth, Google Maps, navigation things, and all this has happened in, in really in 20 years. Uh, so, I, it, I mean, the, the, the pace is so, so quick 
that, of course, when it comes to, to the challenges for government and for policy regulators and certainly for the European Commission, things go so fast that sometimes the time it takes to go through all our legislative processes in Parliament, Council, and then national parliaments, you are four years old already. Eh? So sometimes you are, you are really behind, which are in itself puts, again, other challenges. Or how should you be working on the Internet? Is it regulation? Is it only re regulation? I don't think you can do everything by regulation, so there's a lot of other things to be done. Of course, in the area where I'm working, uh, what, would, what do we want to do on the info, in our information society policies? Well, very simple. What we want is to exploit Internet as much as possible in order to enhance our quality of life, to enhance our knowledge space, to promote innovation, to promote our leisure, to promote our access to culture. I mean, we really want that beautiful tool to make all of its value. So when we talk about, of course, we are talking about a lot about promoting access to information. And we are very much working on that. We are reaching, we're very much working to bring our culture to the digital world, which puts a huge amount of, of, of issues. Digitization, uh, copyright, how do you handle copyright? Should copyright adapt to Internet? Or should the Internet adapt to copyright? Well, I mean, I think that in this forum people will be more inclined to think that the copyright should adapt to the newest, to the newest scenarios than the other way around. But that is a difficult topic. We talk about science, open access to science. How can we make it happen? How do we keep all the huge amount of data that is over there producing our research? How can we keep it? How can we reuse it? How can we make all that happen? We're we talking about public sector information. How should uh, government share the information it produces? I mean, we are talking about uh, wonderful opportunities of Web 2.0, people becoming reusers of information. So all these are huge challenges that we have ahead. Now, we need people like NAXA to help us in shaping the future and shaping our policies. When you are in government, you really need fact-finding, you need evidence, you need independent advice. We need think tanks, we need people who really can bring the ideas forward in a neutral way, that can have credibility, that can be seen as good, uh, independent, honest partners in all this work. You have to be brave, because I can tell you, when you want to change things, someone loses. And typically, of course, the easy thing is to kill the messenger. Oh, that study is rubbish. It was based on completely wrong assumptions. Hypotheses are wrong. I can give you another study. And this is happening every day. So you will be subject to huge scrutiny. So you have to be brave and to be courageous because, I mean, the easy thing, of course, is to say grounds which are not very far-reaching and simply try to please everybody, but that will not work. If you really want to, to become a reference in Europe, and I really hope you become a reference in Europe because you were telling me there are not many places in Europe where we have this, this really visionary goal of becoming a, a, a reference on the Internet in Europe, you really have to, 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 to look at the future in, in, in that way. So basically, apart from that, I mean, uh, you can certainly know, think that the Commission will be one of your clients. We have already been in some of the projects, and we will certainly be behind you in, in, in trying to, to support you grow. But really, I mean, the future becomes really how you are able to pull forces together, multidisciplinary, with other groups in Europe, and really helping us shaping the agenda. And the agenda for us is nothing that, but to make the most out of the Internet. It's not against anybody. It's for society at large. But in that journey, some people, of course, will be outdated, and they will resist. Some people will, of course, be new businesses, and they will really make the most out of it. I mean, you will have to accompany us during that journey. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Communia? Have you followed Communia? Yeah. Well, Communia is a project about the public domain. So in, our, in the unit I, I, I belong, we, we have the feeling that um, the, uh, the public domain has an important value. When we talk about the public domain, you could call things that are not in copyright, but you could also talk about things which people have shared with others, notably through Creative Commons licenses. So, Internet provides a huge opportunity for a shared information space in which people produce information and offer the others to share it. 
the others use it, reuse it, building in new products, and, uh, and, the, and the whole cycle of innovation develops and develops. That, of course, is opposed to the system in you, where you are in real clusters of information. You have to pay for something. You only get a license for very specific. You cannot reuse it. And I mean, all that information, in a way, is put on, 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 on silos. So Communia is a project that what basically wants is to federate different people in the, across the, 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 the European Union uh, thinking uh, about the value of the public domain, how can the public domain be, uh, be pushed forward, how can we push this shared information space. We are not, this is not something against right holders or people who have done creativity, which I think is it's another environment. But there's a huge amount of information there that is serving nobody and the public domain can help. And community has got the task to, 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 to really focus a bit the work of all these groups towards uh, the, the public domain, trying to highlight what is the value of the public domain, trying to make sure that if we, if we, um, if we defend the public domain, that would be good for society at large, and of course, highlighting important problems that we see today. Eh? Sometimes you go to a museum and you see a picture was painted in the 16th century. That's all very nice. But when you go to the internet side and you want to see the same picture, you have to pay. So you will have to answer, I mean, what is this about? We are seeing that sort of, 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 of organizations that are making money of, uh, of, of public domain content. Isn't a sort of privatization of, of the public domain? Uh, I mean, h how come? I mean, I understand that the cultural institutions uh, are, are eager of financial resources, but that puts fundamental, mm, yes. fundamental problems, huh? uh, fundamental problems. And I mean, all this is what Communia is reflecting about. And it's, it's a first try, a first attempt. But the, I'm here in the panel, and Juan Carlos are the persons managing Communia. So they would be better, better than me to tell you, tell you what they are doing on the daily day. I tell you what was the objectives of the Commission when we launched and funded Comunia. Uh, the next, the center, uh, NEXA Center for Internet and Society proposed, uh, uh, wrote a strong paper against the European Union uh, Directive uh, to, on, on phonograms. Now, uh, these kind of works, these kind of papers, uh, do you think they're useful to influence policy in, uh, in, uh, in, ch in choices in uh, the, in the European Committee, and do, do you think that uh, there is hope that this thing, this directive, will not pass? Well, um, the directive was approved by the Commission and now is subject to discussions by the two legislatures, the European Parliament on one side and the Council on the other side. Uh, and they are, of course, taking views of the Commission proposal, and certainly they listen also to to uh, any other sources of information. I think the, the type of paper that NAXA did was indispensable because when, when, when the decision makers are confronted to choices, then of course they will have on one side those who propose to extend the, the duration for, for, for performers. And of course you can very well imagine that the collecting societies and the association of performers have brought forward their ideas, their facts, saying this is the best thing that could be done in the world. And then there are the other side of the, of the, of the, of the story, that is uh, other people that honestly think that this is, would not be a good measure. And that's what Juan Carlos was referring in his, in his introduction, that all academics and experts thought that extending these rights would not bring any benefit to society at large. So basically now, I mean, those, uh, these papers uh, provide the two views. Huh? If you are defending the public domain, the public domain, by definition, has go is orphan. Eh? Who, who is the father of the public domain? But I can tell you that the movie producers are very well organized and, and of course, prepare their papers. So it's indispensable to have these, let's say, counterweights that bring the other views. And then, of course, the members of the parliament and the ministers, in all their knowledge, will take their own decisions, which will be the best, of course. <laughs> Philippe Gren, uh, you're, um, you're here not just as a researcher and uh, author of books uh, about the internet. You're, you're French and you're, you're, you're a witness of uh, the Sarkozy policies on copyright and uh, talking about copyright and uh, uh, 
the, the decision of the French government to uh, cut the uh, uh, access to internet to people who download copyrighted materials has uh, had strong consequences because many other governments are thinking of applying that same kind of policies and uh, Italy is thinking of that, the United States also. What do you think about it? Well, I think it's an excellent illustration of why uh, the work of, of the creation and development of NEXT and other similar initiatives in the world are, are very much needed. Because if, if you want to understand uh, these, these policy moves you have just mentioned, actually you have to, to situate them in a much longer time frame, in a much more global framework. And uh, what, what has really happened is for more than 10 years, the, the debate on the relationship between creative works, the content industry, and the internet has been narrowly framed. And in a nutshell, basically, the, the motto is uh, unauthorized sharing uh, of digital works is lost sales. That's, that, that about tells it all. And, and during that same period, uh, let's say the content players, though they are very interested, maybe very diverse, uh, they, they sought, uh, at least the organized content players, they pushed uh, policy in a consistent direction, uh, which can be summarized as uh, we need to organize on the internet the, the same scarcity of copies of works uh, that exists in, for digital, for publishing on careers in the physical world, and we need to maintain the same separation between producers and consumers. And because this is so, uh, in con so much in contradiction with the natural processes and with the technology and its usage on the internet, they had actually to do to, to do it even more on the internet, to, to, to have a, a stricter scarcity and a, a, a stronger separation between producer and consumer. So many approaches have been tried, uh, repression, policing, free strikes approaches, uh, not so uh, recent but believed, uh, propaganda even in elementary schools, uh, filtering, uh, uh, and none of these approaches has, has, has worked, but together they have shaped our, our, our legal framework where they are all stacked. In some countries there are like 10 texts and each has been made to correct some supposed hole in the previous ones, but none was ever uh, repealed. They, they are all there. I mean, we have, you know, we have the possibility to make compuls DRM compulsory in French law, and it, it has never been used, and I doubt it's going to be, but nonetheless, it's still there. And, uh, but now we are at a turning point. That is a, a very much different landscape emerges, and it's partly because there are people who have produced detailed studies of how things actually work. And studies in, may, in many countries uh, in the past five or six years have shown that the impact of, of sharing is much more complex. Let's say. I say it in, in very cautious terms. It's much more complex. And they, they all hint that at least some of them claim there is no negative impact. Or, or some say it's a differentiated impact. But they all hint that there could be potential benefits in terms of cultural diversity, in terms of cr the, the, the scope and the generalization of creativity, if this sharing of works on the internet could be organized in a manner that generates new resources for creative activities. Proposals have emerged in, in the very diverse circles. I mean, the US, the Electronic Frontier Foundation and Warner Music have both tabled at different stages 
proposals that are surprisingly similar, believe it or, believe it or not, though of course they, they have some, some details that are different. Uh, collective management societies, uh, STEAM in Sweden, CIA in Italy, the performance societies in, in France, the music collective management society in Canadian, academia, NGOs, many people have produced proposals. Now the question is how, how we will, get, will we get to grip with the positive organization uh, of uh, a synergy between sharing of works in the internet and a creative economy. There is a strong risk that of inertia in policy making. That, that is, the debate has been so narrowly framed that uh, it's, there is a risk of doing business as usual for, for many years. Uh, so there is a strong responsibility uh, for NEFSA and for many other uh, uh, active centers in Europe uh, to feed new policy input and also to feed new ideas to the civil society on processes it can organize by itself. It's not just, we must not just rest on, on policy, it's also a matter of what we do ourselves. Uh, and I'm happy to report that NEXA has, has, has started, actually. Uh, it has started under the umbrella of the uh, general ideas on copyright reform uh, that have been mentioned in the work of uh, Marco Ricolfi, but also younger researchers have tabled actual uh, proposals of a practical nature. And I believe it, these proposals have already fueled other ideas in other countries. And that, I would conclude by that by saying that NEXA must have, NEXA is modest in stating its objectives, but it must have uh, a European ambition, a European and global ambition, not, not to, to become the uh, Berkman Bis or whatever, but simply because we need input feedback from other places in the world. We cannot work uh, in a narrow frame of, of a country. And so if there is one thing the funders can do, I turn to my neighbor <laughs> and former colleague, is provide means for, for provide, provide means for researchers to, to come from other countries to come at, uh, at, at NEXA and reciprocally. I mean, it's more for the human capital and mobility programs, and, and I'm, I'm not even sure it's still called like that. But, uh, and of course, this will not happen with it, without NEXA asking for it. So, uh, but I, I urge NEXA to, to ask and, and the funders to realize it's an important thing to do. Thank you. And on, uh, on the open nature of NEXA and on its birth and, as a, and, uh, and, on, and on its global viewing, I think uh, Marco Calderini, Mario Calderini has a, has a point of view he wants to share with us. Tell us about the open nature of NEXA and what you think its, um, its agenda should be starting from there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, um, well, I, I, dare, I dare considering myself a small bit of the, that uh, multidisciplinary movement that generated uh, NEXA. Uh, it's uh, actually a long story of attraction uh, for me and for my group. We are a small group uh, uh, involved in uh, research in the field of uh, economics and management of innovation. And so we, we have been long uh, lounging around uh, the NEXA constituency to see what they were doing and uh, if there was something interesting. And of course we started, uh, uh, we actually generated a few initiatives and we started from the most stupid of the question or the, for, from the most useless of the questions. There was the most popular question uh, among economists ages ago that was why should people have incentives uh, 
to innovate uh, or to produce value without uh, proprietary regimes. Um, and, and so there was a long effort around this question. Uh, fortunately, at, at a certain point, we had to stop asking this uh, clumsy question for two reasons. For, first, because there was an empirical answer that people were actually innovating and investing in the creation of new value without the traditional proprietary regimes. We were patent guys originally. The second, uh, um, a bit more subtle, was that uh, um, we had the impression that in order to answer this question, namely why people was so productive and inventive in an open source environment, um, would have forced us to confront ourselves with uh, psychology or more generally cog cognitive sciences, that is the thing that economists fear most. Uh, so we stopped ask it, asking these questions and then we saw that there were a couple of other very interesting topics uh, that we could have shared with, uh, with this group of uh, scholars. Uh, one, the most Im important one, we, had the, we have the impression, economists have the impression that our world is more or less uh, built uh, on, uh, on the notion of uh, asymmetric information. All transactional economics is based on asymmetric information. And we were actually looking for something that would change, we would structurally change um, the, the nature of asymmetric information. We wanted a natural experiment that would tell us uh, what would have happened to the organization of economic activities with the structural change in the distribution of information. And of course, internet is the most extraordinary example of natural experiment in this sense. Um, in the first phase, I would say that, so we, we thought that uh, the distribution of pa bargaining power in supply chains, for example, um, the, um, the way certain, the, 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 the division of labor itself would have changed a lot with a widespread diffusion of internet and open, open society models. Uh, I would say the, the, the first phase was, was a bit disappointing, if you, with the exception of some very specific phenomena like uh, electronic commerce, eBay, internet auctions, uh, Amazon, a few other things. Actually, in traditional manufacturing sectors or even service sector, I wouldn't see, I wouldn't be able to say that uh, internet, the internet paradigm has produced um, a structural change in transactional relationships between economic agents. Um, now, when we were on the point to be a bit disappointed, uh, I think that the, the, the third generation of uh, question and answers came. And I think this is the most uh, um, challenging uh, and uh, the most fascinating phase. Um, internet, not as a medium, but uh, as a paradigm, has strongly changed the way innovation activities are actually organized. Um, the so-called uh, open innovation model, or more specifically, so-called crowdsourcing, the fact that uh, people can pick up good ideas all over the world, that good ideas are distributed in the most strange places, and we, are, we can actually access these ideas, and that we con can combine these ideas and that in general people are available to share with us these ideas. This is a real change 
in the way innovation activities are organized. Uh, the thing that uh, Procter & Gamble first, now Nokia and many others corporate, uh, corporations did, namely crowdsourcing, asking the world, the single inventors all over the world to be available to share ideas, to contribute with their ideas to the innovative activities of a traditional company like Procter & Gamble, for example. The birth of specialized providers like, for example, Innocentives or Nine Sigma that uh, are specialized in uh, knowledge or technology brokerage is actually, I think, the, the clearest example that Internet has changed eventually at the heart the way innovation activities are performed and the economic rules by which innovation activities are regulated. So, and I am really proud and honored to say that the fact that Nexa was birthed and grown up in, in Turin had a very strong uh, impact uh, on, uh, on, on, on local policies. It is a good example of how internet is, is not actually an object of policy but a subject of policies. Uh, Nexa or the cultural allure of Nexa influenced uh, in innovation policies of the region and I don't think it is by chance that this region is the first region that um, launched a very big uh, uh, funding program for uh, technological brokerage and crowdsourcing. So this region said, I, 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 I tend to abandon the, 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 the small cluster logic, so the fact that I want to get companies become bigger in their knowledge stock, just putting together uh, two, um, two or three companies very close uh, in a geographical space, but I want to fund our companies to look for ideas all over the world and to use the distributed community of inventors that is available all over the world. And I think that is a uh, merit of uh, of Nexa, at least on a, on a cultural ground. Okay, well, uh, before we conclude, because the time is, is almost up, uh, since we want to be more, most practical and, uh, and go beyond theory of studying the internet and the international, from the international point of view, I mean, if you really want to give Nexa an advice, and what can be done very, in a very useful way for Italian society for, and also for the international community. What should be the agenda? I mean, what are the first steps? What, what does Nexa have to make sure that it does? When, why don't you start? Yeah, I'm looking at you first and then we go around. Um, um, so, I'm, I'm not, actually I don't want to do the, what the, the, the research agenda can be. But I do want to make very brief comments on what the organization, how the organization might approach it. One, I think um, embodying the characteristics of the net, as we've just heard, within the organization is key. This means sort of dynamic, um, uh, changing as necessary, thinking about how things scale, um, being creative, innovative, not about the technology, but about the culture and the ideas that go along with it. Um, Second, as part of that, um, thinking uh, deeply and creatively and actively about collaboration and partnerships, ranging from partnerships with, uh, within the Politecnico to other research centers, to government, to uh, business and uh, other civil society, um, and thinking about how you, uh, what the role of Nexa is, 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis its capacity <clears throat> to deliver research, a paper that says this is what we know versus uh, leaning into advocacy and thinking about how far into advocacy it wants to be versus uh, how, uh, how more grounded in research and how uh, those two uh, work with each other. And then uh, thirdly, um, to take the long view, as uh, Philippe proposed, to recognize that all these issues are massive issues uh, that are changing before our very eyes. They're deeply interconnected. Um, uh, people are confused. No one has the answers. Um, and we will take steps forward and back over time. Um, and so to recognize what's a, what's a sort of, what's a battle, what's one step in this process versus what's the, the really big overarching significant goal. And to think about how each of the steps that we take, each little paper or each gathering, each small step uh, is contributing to that larger vision. And to keep that larger vision in mind and recognize that as you um, make choices about these small steps, the items on the research agenda, the products that um, you deliver from that on that research agenda, to make sure that they fit within that um, within that template for uh, the path as best we can uh, discern it to that overarching goal. Um, and so that's just an argument to sort of balance those two. So those are my three uh, thoughts on how to approach it, not the answer. However. Would you like to add, add something to this? Well, I think that the, the tasks they have ahead certainly are going to keep the, all the people in NEXA uh, very occupied and, and, and listen to Juan Carlos and join them their time a lot in the coming years because the issues are huge. And one thing one, what is for me crucial is, to, is proactivity. I mean, you're in a center that you have to help shape policy and that brings raising issues, participating in, in, in topics from the, from the beginning. Now, uh, when you come to the European Union and to the European Commission, uh, things start really uh, many times bottom up in discussion groups, in, uh, in, in, in working groups, in high level groups. I mean, you have to be present there because it is there where things start to take shape. Those ideas are subsequently incorporated into funding programs such as Philippe mentioned that, that, that you need. But it's very important, I think, that proactivity. And the second, of course, is to, you have to make some choices because Internet and society is so vast that it is very difficult to be uh, first class in everything. So I'm sure that you know very well at what you are best. And excellence would be extremely important. So that really, in a couple of years, I really hope that when we talk about Nexa, uh, we don't have to say anything else. Eh? We know that it is simply, it is synonymous of high quality advice, reputation, and it's a place in where people will be really wanting to come here to, to do their work. If you manage that in five years, I mean, you certainly will have succeeded. Huh? Five years. Okay. Well, there is, the territory is re relatively virgin, huh? so. <laughs> Philippe, is there Five something you would more. like to add to this? I think the previous speaker said the most important things, but uh, uh, one I would repeat from what uh, Javier hernandez Ross said, I mean, uh, I, I don't doubt that you are brave, so I'm not going to, to tell you you need to be brave. I know you are, but so I will tell something a bit different. I say accumulate. I mean, you... You know, you, you have produced a position paper on, on, on against copyright term extension. It's a relatively easy thing to oppose. Doesn't mean this opposition will be successful, but it's, uh, but you will produce others, keep a memory, uh, I mean, uh, uh, accumulate things because that will be the, uh, the obvious embodiment of uh, uh, what, what is your, let's say, your, your policy input identity. The other thing I would say is identify what is missing. I think uh, NEXA has a strong responsibility like other centers in defining a roadmap for future future research, future substantiation of, of uh, possible approaches. And uh, uh, actually we tend sometimes, you know, when, when we have an argument we would like to make 
mistake and both our intuition, our heart and our guts tell us it's right, but we do not have the matter to prove that it is the right argument, then I think it means we have work that needs to be done. And sometimes we don't have the tools to do it immediately, but it's good to, to publish this need because that is likely to, to bring the means or the partners or whatever. Before introducing the next panel, I just wanted to say and remind everybody that um, we have two representatives of the Internet Governance Forum here, and they're both uh, Italian, and they went actually to the Internet Governance Forum. It's Fiorello Cortiana is sitting over there, and Professor Stefano Rodotà. And uh, I'm sure they can join in the conversation. Maybe later we, we will have a time for discussion to actually say what the topics are, have, are really, what the agenda is internationally at the Internet Governance Forum and what are really the issues that are most important, most urgent to solve. I mean, Rodota, Professor Rodota traced, traced his agenda and it seems, you know, that that is a framework. But there are so many issues, I mean, from digital divide and access and from net neutrality to privacy, transparency, the need, the need for new copyright laws. Uh, all these issues are so many and so complex, and many, all governments are facing these issues in different ways. The Internet Governance Forum is an international place where everybody's meeting and trying to set that agenda. Maybe you can tell us about it, Fiorello, later. Uh, I think we should give time to the next panel, right? Because we are actually. Sono 12. Luca, vieni tu. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>